Hi, my name is Kevin Vines, and I live in London, Ontario. And my question is for the financial advisor. I'm wondering now that interest rates have dropped so dramatically, and that hopefully the recession is bottoming out, whether it would be a good time to leverage money to invest in the market. Thank you very much. Gordon, good question. Is this the right time to borrow money to invest in the market? Well, you know, we saw a lot of that, of course, in the 1980s. I mean, this was the time of the big leveraged buyouts and all the rest of it, and probably was not the best time to do it. This is really a much better time to do it. Now, I'm not a big fan of borrowing to invest, and I should make this clear right from the start, that, uh, you know, when you borrow to invest, you do add to your risk. But nonetheless, if you're going to do it, you should do it under two conditions. Number one, you do it when interest rates are down, and certainly they are down now, so you're not paying as much as you would pay it at other times. Also, of course, you get a benefit from the fact that your interest is tax deductible when you borrow to invest, so it's not costing you as much. Secondly, if you're going to leverage, you do it at a time when you have a good opportunity to invest in a security or some type of investment at a reasonable price. You're going to uh, do it to invest in real estate, for example. Right now is a good time to do it. The real estate prices are down. Some people uh, will uh, leverage real estate. You're going to do it to invest in the stock market. Uh, well, the stock market has uh, really uh, done quite well on that year-end rally, uh, so perhaps you might wait a bit. I think that the market will come off again before it goes back up. Then you would borrow at that point in time to invest in the market. But the key is to do it when you can get an investment at a reasonable price and the cost is going to be relatively little compared to what it was when interest rates were high. Okay, and go for things like blue chips or mutual funds or RSPs? Or something that had, you don't go for something that's highly speculative. Okay. Uh, the, the, the key here is that you want to minimize your downside risk because when you borrow to invest, what happens is that you increase your upside potential, you increase your profit potential, but if things go sour, your losses are going to be much heavier. So you have to know what you're doing, you have to be careful, and you have to be prepared to accept a loss if indeed things don't go your way. Okay, is it good to borrow the money then and maybe put it into uh, an RSP, like to sort of top up your uh, maximum contribution? Well, that's a, that's a possibility. If you want to invest in an RSP, uh, you cannot deduct, however, the interest when you do that. Okay. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. But nonetheless, that, that's a good way to use leveraging. It's time for another video letter. This one is from a woman in Toronto who's interested in herbal remedies. My name is Lee Block. I'm from Toronto, and I have a uh, question for the medicine department. Uh, having been interested in natural remedies for a long time, I'd like to know what reliable source exists in getting information for some of the herbal remedies that exist. Um, having purchased a book called the Rodale Encyclopedia of Herbs, I find out that a lot of the herbs, um, not only are they not effective, some of them are dangerous and some of them are even toxic. Um, and they're still available. I'd like to know how I can find out as a consumer before I go and buy a, a herbal product what's safe and what's not safe and, and even what's effective. Well, Carolyn, this is a very important question. I know a lot of people would like to stop taking an awful lot of prescription drugs, but they want something a little more reliable than Great Granny's remedies. <laughs> so is there anywhere they can go and get a good evaluation of herbal remedies? Well, now, Matthew, Granny's herbal remedies, uh, they've worked for thousands of years, so we have to take that into consideration. The fact that things have been used, um, clinical, empirical evidence, anecdotal evidence, if you like, that herbs have been useful. Now that's important. I'll take on the other hand that between 30,000 and 140,000 people die per year in the United States from the use of prescription drugs. And all of a sudden we're saying uh, herbs have to be pristine, pure, and never cause any, any bit of problem at all, but drugs are doing all this, this damage. So the government, I think we'll talk about this with Leaf, has an organization where it's trying to uh, number and license herbs so that people can feel very safe about herbs. Okay, well great, I have Lisa on the line. Hi, welcome to Q&A. Hi. Hi. Uh, Lisa, I believe you have another question about a new class of drugs. Uh, th yes, there was a, a, a something about the Canadian government perhaps classifying certain herbs as, as drugs. And I just wanted to know if that had been started or done or... Well, we received some information that talked about, um, I think it's folklore 
herbal um, remedies being put in a, in a classification. And a person would make an application to the government uh, explaining the, the herb and what it had been used for. If it's been used for two or three hundred years, then it can be classified as grass, generally accepted as safe. And um, I think this is important, as I was saying before, there, there are toxins in, in so many things. Comfrey, for example, is a herb that a lot of people uh, don't realize they shouldn't be ingesting by mouth. There are many things that will come out of this information from the government, and we'll give you information uh, on that at the, end of the, at the end of this spot. Lise, do you have another question for Carolyn? Uh, yes, I do, actually. I'd like to know how it is you know when you go into a herbal shop what's safe and what's not safe. I mean, is it marked on a package that you shouldn't ingest comfrey or that, you know, you shouldn't uh, be eating some of those herbal remedies? Yes, that's a great question, and I'm sure that's what the government agency is trying to inform people of. But there are books, um, the, the one I refer to is, uh, is this book on the science of herbal medicine. And what you want to do is find a book that is willing to talk about the, the toxic properties. If you find a book that just gives all the beneficial effects of herbs and doesn't go into the possible side effects or the to toxic elements, then you haven't found the right book. And you do have to do your own reading. Um, and you also have to inform the government when you want information about uh, different herbs. Okay. Well, I hope we've been of some help, Lise. Yes, yes, you have. Great. I've got a uh, phone number here in case you'd like to get in touch with some people, so you may want to get a pen. If you also have any questions about nat uh, nature's drugs, you can contact the Bureau of Non-Prescription Drugs, General Consumer Inquiries in Ottawa. You can phone area code 613-954-6456. Now, Gordon, although we're going to be doing an RSP special with you next month, this uh, caller circumstances seemed rather desperate, so we thought we'd air this one now. Hello. I was wondering if there were any circumstances under which a locked-in RRSP can be utilized or, or broken down. Um, my circumstances are such that I have no money and I'm forced to go to welfare and live off the charity of friends while I have $10,000 sitting in a locked-in RRSP. Uh, I'd like to find out if I can access that money. Your help would be most appreciated in this. Well, Gordon, is there any way that Carol can get her hands on her money to help get her through these difficult times? Gosh, I wish there was. I, I wish we had a more positive answer for you, Carol. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, let me just explain for a moment what uh, locked in RSP is. This uh, is an RSP that results from the fact that you at one point had a pension plan, you're working, uh, you had vested pension benefits from your employer, and obviously when you uh, left uh, the organization, you chose to have those vested pen uh, pension benefits put into a locked in RSP. In Ontario, the only way you can take the money out of that plan is uh, to have an annuity, uh, which you would then draw on at the time uh, of your retirement. There is no way that I know of, and I've talked to some other financial planners about this, that you can break out of a locked-in RSP. And the reason is simply is it was designed to protect people so that their pension benefits would not be encroached on. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the flexibility to meet real emergencies such as Carol has, and we cannot give her any better news, I'm afraid. Is there any way that she might be able to borrow against that no, RSP? you cannot borrow against any RSP, locked in or not. 